Well, once again, I um, appreciate the opportunity to be uh, here to minister the Word of God. And sometimes as pastors, um, we, uh, when we sit down too long, uh, we, we are not used to it. <laughs> we need to get back to the pulpit <laughs> to uh, preach a word. And it's always a joy uh, for the opportunity uh, to minister the word. I've been asked to uh, preach on uh, soul winning. And uh, so this morning, uh, let us take our Bibles and let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 13 and verse 3 to verse 9. Matthew chapter 13 and uh, verse 3 to verse 9. Let us stand as we uh, read the uh, Word of God, as I read the Word of God. In Matthew chapter 3 and, uh, 13 and verse 3 to verse uh, 9. In Matthew 13, it reads, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he had sowed, some seeds uh, fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. And some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell unto good ground and brought forth fruits, some in hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who had ears to hear, let him hear. Let us pray. Father, I want to give thanks for this uh, blessed uh, time to be in the house of the Lord. And as we gather here, Lord, we seek your presence. To be with us, we say given the power of God to open the hearts and ears. And above all, Lord, we seek the working of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, that souls can be truly born again unto Thee, and the hearts of the believers can be a challenge even to uh, win others uh, for Thee. We thank You and we ask all this in Christ's most precious name. Amen. Please have a seat. The parable of the sower is a very simple parable, and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ will teach on things that um, the folks in his day uh, will understand. Many of them are farmers, uh, were farmers, and uh, we see that um, when you take a bunch of seeds, and then as you scatter them, uh, some will fall into hard grounds, and you find that um, it just wouldn't germinate, and then the birds of the air will come and uh, pick it up. And then some will fall on shallow ground, and uh, you see that seed will germinate for a little while. But once the uh, sun is up, you know, the heat is on, and the drought is on, we find uh, those uh, uh, young plants will die quickly. And others will fall on stony ground. Uh, they will grow up for a little while, and then the, um, I'm sorry, not stony ground, but the uh, ground thorns, and then the thorns will choke it, and it becomes unfruitful. And then there will be some that will fall on good grounds. And so this morning, the title for the sermon is The Sower. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ begins this, this um, uh, parable in verse 3. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And uh, I like that uh, first, uh, the word that behold. I mean, to, um, to see a Christian, a believer, that is going out to win soul is a wonder to behold. I mean, there are many churchgoers, many believers, you know, many faithful members, but to see somebody that actually go out and tell another person about Jesus Christ, it is a wonder to behold. Because most of the times, uh, we are either too uh, frightened to share the Word of God, uh, we don't want to be embarrassed, you know, and uh, sometimes we get lazy. And um, so there are many Christians in the world, uh, but very few are actually so witness. It is said that 80 to 90 percent of church members uh, have never led a single soul to the Lord. I mean, uh, that is the statistics. I mean, they will be in church. Uh, but they have never led somebody to the Lord. And so um, we want to be reminded uh, of the Word of God. When God saved us, He saved us so that we could bring the Word of God to another person uh, that can be safe. I don't think any one of us will want to go into eternity to be safe alone. I think it's a, um, 
a miserable concept. One day when we walk to heaven, we just walk alone, and yet we have a whole lifetime of opportunity to share uh, the Word of God uh, with others. So winning should be in the heart of every believer. If we are truly believers in the Lord, we believe in heaven, we believe in hell, we believe if a soul doesn't have the gospel, doesn't have the Lord Jesus Christ, he must die in his sin and end up in a place called hell forever. And if that's truly our conviction, then uh, we would want to uh, bring the word of God to another. We want to share the word of God and so that someone else will come to the gospel of, uh, to, to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone can and should be a soul winner. It's not again about ability, but availability. Um, it is a hard issue. I mean, if you really want to do something, you'll get it done. I mean, um, if our little kids are sick in the middle of the night, you know, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., I mean, we'll get up no matter how tired we are, take them to the hospital, and uh, we do everything for our child. And likewise with soul winning, it is a hard issue. Uh, it's not about obstacle, it's not, it's not really about fear, uh, but it's, it's a hard issue. The amazing thing is this, is that um, sometimes, maybe especially for the ladies when they watch uh, some dramas on the television, and they could tell the whole story from beginning to the end. <laughs> you know, but yet the simple story of Jesus Christ Sometimes we find we are so reluctant to tell another person that God loves us. He came and died for us to save our soul from hell. And um, so uh, we can do that. If we can share with somebody about some dramas and some story we heard, I'm sure we can tell the story of Jesus Christ too and how he came to uh, save us. Um, this morning, we're going to look at three major headings. And the first one is the sower, and then we are followed by the seed, and then the sowing. And so first we want to look at the uh, sower, and uh, again the uh, word behold is very telling. It's like uh, this um, believer in Christ uh, kind of uh, stands out, you know, among the rest. And Jesus Christ said, behold, you know, the sower, the one that would uh, take the seed and, and scatter the seed and then um, see a harvest to come. And uh, likewise, uh, we don't have to turn there, but in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 10 and verse 13 to verse 15, it talks about um, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel and they bring great glad tidings. And um, so uh, in the eyes of God, their feet are really beautiful. <laughs> um, boy, you know, I hope we don't go to heaven with ugly feet <laughs> um, or smelly feet. <laughs> For that matter, but the uh, Bible says how beautiful are the feet of them uh, that, that preach the gospel. And so um, it is said that um, you can put a man and uh, put him and lock him up in a barrel and then just weave a little hole. And then you can whisper the gospel to him and he can get safe. I mean, it's just all it requires. It's just uh, our words. Um, I was telling them of the gospel. Someone once said, uh, never has been such a thing that a man's eternity depends on the word of, of another. You know, when we, what we share with them about the gospel, his whole eternity, you know, depends upon our words, what we tell them about the gospel. Now, first thing about the sower is that he has a uh, very um, unique heart. Uh, in other words, uh, once a believer, a person is born again, there's something special happen uh, in the person. Uh, there is a conversion. All things become new. And um, so anyone who is truly born again has that um, genuine love for God and also a love for another person coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this past year, back in Singapore, uh, in our church, Shalom Baptist Church, a uh, Muslim uh, man came to know the Lord. And his name is, he changed to a Christian named Jeremiah. And the amazing thing about him is this. Number one, he's a Muslim. And um, he took that step of faith to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to be his savior. 
And that means, uh, you know, in time to come, uh, he will be probably kicked out of his family. In fact, he's all ready to leave the home. <laughs> and secondly, uh, how we know he's truly converted? Because when we have our in-house lunch in the church, uh, he goes for the pork, all right? <laughs> And once he starts eating pork, uh, we know that's a true convert <laughs> because a Muslim will never eat pork. And the other thing about him is this. Uh, he brought his colleagues to church to hear the gospel. He heard of another church member whose mother, who's a Chinese, uh, who is Chinese, but he's a, she's a Chinese Muslim. And uh, he wanted to go and talk to her because she's hospitalized. And uh, this is, um, you know, we see the, um, the, the, uh, a real genuine conversion. When a man truly is born again, he is heaven bound. He has a different vision. He has a love for the lawns. And um, I mean, he was really amazing. Um, I remember uh, in my own uh, personal conversion, uh, I came to know the Lord at the age of 16. And a cousin of mine brought a stack of uh, Czech publication tracts, and I read them, and that afternoon I prayed to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody was around me, and the Word of God was sufficient uh, to open my eyes to the reality of a holy God, and I'm a sinner. And uh, that afternoon I took Jesus Christ to be my Savior. And uh, one of the things that after conversion, um, I really didn't know anything much. Uh, I remember my first uh, soul-winning encounter. I took the Bible. I was in the military. And uh, this guy was pretty uh, kind of down and out, and I had the opportunity to sit, to sit down with him. I didn't know how to uh, share the gospel, so I opened to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You know, and God made the plants and the animals and so on, and we'll go on to chapter 2 and so on. But I didn't know how to share the gospel. You know, but I try, and of course, eventually, um, um, over the years, I acquired the, uh, uh, the knowledge and the skill and the ability to uh, share the Word of God. I remember in the military, uh, 2 a.m. in the morning, when we were doing guard duties, uh, the sentry, and I go up to the sentry and I will share the gospel with him, 2 a.m. in the morning. Uh, what drives me? Well, it's just a natural love of God and love for souls. Um, so it's just like the woman at the well in the Gospel of John chapter 4, you don't have to turn there. And once she realized Jesus is the Messiah, she went out and she said, you know, come see a man which uh, told me all these things that I, I, I ever did. And uh, the moment the uh, woman at the well was converted, uh, the next thing is that she wants others to know uh, the Word of God. And so um, we see that um, the soul winner has a, uh, a very unique heart, and uh, he, he, he wants to see others to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, he has a crystal clear vision. A farmer knows that if he doesn't go out to plant the seeds, there will be no harvest. I mean, we can be sitting down. Uh, can you imagine a farmer sitting down in his home? And he said, by six months' time, there'll be harvest. But why are you doing nothing? You know, there's no harvest. And same thing if we do not bring the gospel out to someone to hear the word of God. Um, nobody will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. This church is not going to grow, you know, and souls are not going to be saved. And by the way, the uh, Great Commission is not given to Pastor Bramlin. The Great Commission is given to every one of us. You know, we are the recipient of the Great Commission. And uh, the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't talking to the pastor alone, but to the whole church. Now, uh, we see that the next thing is that um, the, um, the sower has a crystal clear vision. He knows he must plan. If, he does, if, he, if not, he will not have a harvest. And likewise, a soul winner knows that if he doesn't share the word of God, no souls will be safe. Someone once said that uh, it takes our generation to win our generation. We can't win the generation before us, and we can't win the generation after us. The only time is for us to save our generation. 
And um, in the, uh, if you take your Bibles and just turn with me quickly to Luke chapter 16 for a quick moment. In Luke 16, in chapter 16 and verse 23, In Luke 16 and in verse 23, it says, In hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his fingers, finger in water and cool my tongues, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted. And thou art tormented, and beside all this between us and you there is a great God fix, so that they which were passed from hands to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that will come from things. And so the uh, rich man and uh, Lazarus um, both have different lives. And uh, one eventually end up in hell. The Bible says the rich man, he woke up in hell. I mean, there's no fanfare. You know, when somebody dies, there's really no fanfare. It's just simply, you wake up either in heaven or you wake up in hell. Um, the passage about this rich man in hell is a haunting passage. I mean, this happened probably about 2,000 years ago. And the rich man... It is still in torments, and it's still crying out for somebody to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool his tongue. You know, for the last 2,000 years, he is still crying. The sower has a crystal clear vision. Anyone without the Savior will die in his sin. And when they die in his sin, and when they die in their sin, there is only one place they will wake up to. And that is the eternal hell. Um, just about a month ago or so, I had the um, problem of a kidney stone. I know when it's coming out. Um, so if you have any inkling about a kidney stone, uh, it works this way. Uh, the pain, the threshold of the pain is equivalent to childbirth. And so about 20 years ago, I had one. I went to the A&E. I was on my knees, and they had to give me two shots of painkillers. And I didn't know the, how, how painful it was until when I read about it, it's equivalent to childbirth pain. So I told Janet I'd given birth twice, right? Once 20 years ago, one last month. And um, I had seven hours of intense pain. I mean, um, and uh, when I'm going through that pain, I can think of nothing else, but all my focus and concentration is on that pain. You know, how to just keep breathing and endure the pain, you know, and uh, wondering when you'll be over. <coughs> and when I was going through that seven hours of pain, you know, the thought came to my mind about this rich man in hell. You see, the rich man in hell, he can't think about finding a partner in life, you know, building a home, planning for retirement, you know, planning for a holiday. All his fo focuses and concentration is just on the pain. I mean, for all eternity. <laughs> Frankly speaking, I still can't fathom it because my own dad did not believe in the Lord. You know, I still can't uh, compute and digest it. Um, that uh, eternity in, in hell. And so uh, it is for this reason, the soul winner, he puts on a different uh, uh, pair of glasses. He sees through a different color. And he sees the worm. When people are lost without Christ, you know, they are hell bound. And he loves them. He wants to give them the gospel. He wants to tell them there's a God that loves them and uh, that died for them to save them. It is said that um, there was a time where there is kind of an um, earthquake and building collapse and people were digging in the rubble you know, to, to uh, save some of the living underneath. And they noticed one man, he was digging furiously, unlike the rest. And they were kind of curious, they asked him. He said, because I was under there and I was rescued, I know what is it like to be inside there. 
you know, am I digging furiously because they have only so much time to survive. And so, um, uh, unless we have a crystal clear vision about hell, I don't think that we will be very much motivated to bring the gospel uh, to another. It is said that William Booth, the founder of Salvation Army, he made a statement, he said, I wish to bring you know, all uh, his people to the age of hell and let them look into it. And because when they see that, then you'll find that their motivation for soul winning is different. Not that we agree, agree everything with Salvation Army, um, but uh, that was what uh, was his uh, vision, to reach out to the Lord's. Now the sower, beside that he has a, um, a, a different heart, a unique heart, he has a sort of crystal clear vision, he has a passionate love. He has a passionate love. Uh, with our Bible, so let's turn to 2 Timothy in chapter 1 and verse 3 to verse 7. I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 2 rather, and in verse 10, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10. In verse 10, the apostle Paul said, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul said, I endure all things for the elect's sake. Um, I can imagine Paul was stoned. Paul was... Um, uh, criticized, Paul was slander, you know, Paul was uh, mishandled. And yet, despite all this thing, Paul said, I endure all things. And he said, for the elect's sake. Because if Paul did not endure, I say to our folks back in Singapore, if Paul did not endure, there may not be a Shalom Baptist Church in Singapore. You know, because he endured, you know, he passed the baton on, the gospel on. That somebody else got saved, and somebody else got saved, and somebody one day came to Singapore, you know, and planted a church. And then we see that there are many uh, other Baptist churches and churches all over the world. Um, so Paul said, I endure all things. You see, Paul had a, a passionate love for soul. Uh, take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3 to verse 7. In verse 3 to verse 7, the same book, uh, 2 Timothy. In verse 3, it reads, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee which dwell first in thy grandmother, Louis, and in thy mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in thee also. Wherefore I put the remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. And in verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Timothy, the young pastor, in his ministry, uh, he had many tears. And Paul said, I pray for you, Timothy, every day. And you know, I'm mindful of your many tears. You see, Timothy... Uh, is timid, although that's not the meaning of Timothy, <laughs> you know. And uh, Timothy is timid. Uh, he's a young pastor, probably of an older church, a church of Ephesus. And um, he had many tears. See, but the one thing about the ministry is that uh, those who are serving the ministry, uh, they have many tears. They have fears and tears. But one thing is that they kept going. Um, so it is with the soul witness. Believe me, when I give a track to somebody, and um, is there any fear? There is. And you know, sometimes you don't feel like doing it. In fact, some of my best soul winning is I don't feel like doing it, and I told myself, just give the track and then start talking. <laughs> and um, we find that uh, that's how we um, share the gospel. And so um, the uh, soul has that passionate love, despite his obstacles, difficulties, fear, um, he uh, persevered on. And the Bible tells us in the book of Psalm 126, you don't have to turn there, but it says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed 
shall doubtless come again, with rejoicing, bring his Shiva with him. <coughs> he has a passionate love, and uh, he would uh, keep uh, sharing the gospel. It is said that in the UK, uh, in yesteryears, where they had this huge revival in the UK, and uh, it is said that the average believer in God heard the gospel 12 times. It's not one time they come for a revival meeting and one time they got saved. Many of them, when they did the statistics, they heard the gospel at least 12 times. And um, never underestimate the word of God. I read an account of a man. When he was a young person, he heard, the word, heard a street a preacher who said, Give, give me thy, my son, give me thy heart. And he said that verse stays with him for the next 50 years. And then one day he awoke his conscience and finally uh, drove him to believe in God. And so um, the soul winner has this passionate love and he'll keep sowing regardless of where the seed will fall on the hard ground, stony ground, thorny ground, the good ground, and he keep sowing. Now, the fourth thing is that the uh, sower is a student of souls. In other words, he studied uh, on soul winning. Uh, Jesus Christ said uh, in Matthew 4, 19, you don't have to turn there. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. If we follow Christ, he's going to make us fishers of men. And how, how, uh, how, how, how do we become fishers fisher, of men? Well, we study. You know, we learn. I don't know, I haven't seen any doctors uh, that uh, became a doctor um, by just wanting to become a doctor without even studying to be a doctor. You know, any lawyer became a lawyer and uh, without studying, and we know that anything that we want to pursue, uh, we, we study, we learn. And um, so it is no different with soul winning. As I said a while ago, the first time I did the soul winning, I, I just opened the Bible from Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. You know, I, I could start, but I didn't know how to end soul winning. <laughs> um, but um, over the years, uh, I acquired the, uh, the knowledge, the skill, and the ability. <coughs> I read a uh, little narrative of a uh, churchgoer who kind of uh, goes to church uh, every Sunday. And he said this, he said, um, I am tired of being put through a guilt trip. You know, every Sunday when I go to church, and the preacher will pound the pulpit and say, you got to win soul. And if you don't win soul, you know, you're a sinful you know, believer and things like that. He said, I got tired of being put through a guilt trip. And he said something. He said, he said I wanted to be a soul winner. And then he said, but will somebody show me how? Will somebody show me how? It is for that reason that uh, propelled me to uh, write uh, this book, The Soul Winner's Handy Guide. And this is something like 20 years ago. And I put in like 40 questions, commonly asked questions that people were asked. Um, and um, thankfully, uh, it has been used uh, in the Philippines, uh, in the Bible colleges. And uh, one Bible college in Scotland used it as a textbook. You know, and some other Bible student colleges, they do use it. Uh, it's a passion in my heart, the ministry of the printed page. But coming back here, if we want to be a soul winner, we study. I mean, um, we can take the Bible, we can read it, we can study it. And the amazing thing is that um, each time that when we fail in soul winning, and then we go back to do soul winning again, we actually become more and more proficient. You know, some questions, we get stunned by it. But when we go back, we pray about it, we open our Bible, we talk to the pastor, we get the answer. And the next time we do soul winning, we can engage them meaningfully and to win them to the Lord. And so we do not quit. I can't imagine a, a little a toddler maybe like Alex and uh, when they're younger, and then when they walk and they, they, they fell, and then they say, it's enough, I don't want to walk anymore. <laughs> you know, that little kid will never walk. But what do they do? They stand up, they walk, they fall, they stand up, they walk, they fall, eventually they walk perfectly. 
And so it is with soul winning. And uh, it doesn't mean that the first time we fail, we stop doing soul winning. We go back again, we do it again and again and again. The Bible tells us to give an answer to every man that asks us the reason of our belief, as in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Now the soul winner, he has a life's mission. He has a life's mission, and he knows he has this life's mission, and that is to win others to the Lord. Uh, in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 28, uh, let's turn there, and in verse 18, the Great Commission. Matthew 28 and verse 18, 19, and 20, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. This is a great commission to go all over the world. Uh, you preach a gospel here, we preach a gospel in Singapore, you know, and uh, we go all over the world to scatter the seeds of the Word of God. And um, the, the sower has a life's mission. I've heard uh, more than once uh, strong believers in the Lord will, make this, uh, will give this testimony. And they will say something like this, My work is my hobby. <laughs> All right? And then the ministry is my real work. <laughs> you know? I mean, you don't have to be in the full-time ministry, but wherever you are, the big picture is that I got a ministry. <laughs> you know, I got my mission few that the others can, ne can never reach there. Maybe among your colleagues, among your friends, among your, you know, in the school. And that may be your very unique mission field, which only you can reach them. I appreciate um, um, Janet, even the library, and after working with her colleagues for a while, uh, she tried to share the gospel, but she was cut off real quickly. <laughs> you know, occasionally, I would go to the library and sit outside and do some of my work. And there was a, uh, there is a Singapore lady that always go to the library about our age, and uh, I gave her, uh, I tried to give her a, a, my book, and she said, no, straight away. <laughs> you know what I mean? Then another, another day, I just posed a question, like, why you don't believe in Christianity or believe in God? And she spent one hour explaining why. And that helps me to understand why. All right, and the next time we meet, you know, I'm going to explain to her a little bit more. And um, the soul winner has a life's mission. Um, Everywhere he goes, he's constantly on the lookout for soul. It is said that uh, there is a difference between a fishing boat and the, uh, and the uh, luxury cruiser. Now, if you go for a cruise, you're not looking for fishes. But if you are in a fishing boat, you're looking for fishes. And likewise, the soul winner is constantly on the lookout for someone to share the gospel. Okay, but if we are on the cruiser, we're not interested in fishes. You know, so I hope that we are, we are reminded so we are not a tourist on this earth. Um, well, uh, just before I came here and I was with Gretel and we were in the uh, bank in Singapore and after all these years, uh, she needs to open up an account. So I went with her and she went to the uh, counter. She opened an account with the bank and it was about closing time, very few customers, and I was with the security guard. You know, and I started to share the gospel with the security guard. Um, and uh, halfway through, I said, uh, we're talking about sin. And I said, for example, if I were to rob a bank, and that was the bank, all right? <laughs> you know what I mean? And if the police were to arrest me, I can't tell the judge that I've done this good and done that good. If I rob the bank, if I have broken the law, I have to be punished. And you know, so I was just talking and sharing if I were to rob a bank. And Greta overheard me and said, Dad, you shouldn't have used that illustration. This is the bank, all right? <laughs> <coughs> and don't say that if I you know, were to rob a bank, because you're right in the bank, all right? 
man, they could uh, throw you into prison for that. But, uh, you know, as believers in the Lord, we should be constantly on the lookout. When opportunity avail, when the Spirit of God promise, you know, we should share the gospel. And same thing at the airport, uh, you know, while waiting uh, at the gate, uh, there was a little massage chair massaging your, your feet. I sat there and somebody sat next to me. And since he's there and me here, you know, he got nothing, he got nowhere to go. So <laughs> I started to talk to him about the gospel. And all he said was, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. But at least I said something to him, you know, about the gospel. <coughs> and same while we're here, we talk to our neighbor, you know, in the library, we try to talk to some people. Um, and uh, just like uh, the um, Philip and the Ethiopian, the eunuch, when the Spirit prompted Philip, you know, go and kind of join yourself to the chariot, and uh, we ought to be sensitive uh, to the Holy Spirit the prompting. Um, <coughs> and so we see the soul winner, uh, he has a heart, he has a vision. Right, he has a mission, he has a love, and of course, he is always searching for souls to win. Next, we want to go on to the seed. Um, the seed is amazing. Uh, I'm sure, the, actually, uh, for us coming from Singapore to Australia, one of the things that we experience as new to us is there's such a thing called a garden, all right? <laughs> because we live mainly in apartments. I mean, 40-story, 30-story, and um, so uh, in our garage, there are some cracks, and you see the weeds growing in the crack. I mean, the seed is so powerful. <laughs> Just a little bit of earth, you know, a little bit of water, a little bit of crack, and you find it germinates, and it starts to grow. And so it is with the uh, seed, the Word of God. It is independent of us. Does it dawn on us? The, the seed is independent. The Word of God is independent of us. Um, I'm eternally grateful to that cousin of mine who gave me the chick publication tracks to read, and I became a pastor. Uh, sometime when I met him, I jokingly said to him, I say, you know, it's your fault that I became a pastor. <laughs> you know, you gave me those tracks to read. Um, but the thing about my cousin uh, is that... Um, after that period of time where he was so enthusiastic about sharing with me the gospel, since that time, he hasn't been to church for the last almost 30 years. Yeah. Uh, the seed is independent of the soul. <laughs> All right. You can give the seed to somebody and can be the mo you can be the most backslidden Christian and that seed will still germinate and grow. And uh, over and over again, um, you find that there are people who came to know the Lord just through this seed. Uh, it's amazing. It is said that Charles Haddon Spurgeon, um, he was kind of struggling trying to find God. And one day he went to a small little church and he sat down there and the pastor was sick. So the Sunday school teacher came and taught a, a lesson, a very simple lesson. But Spurgeon was saved because he quoted that verse, Look unto me and be, be saved all the ends of the earth, in Isaiah 45 and 22. And uh, that verse hit Spurgeon, and he was trying to ask himself, How can I be saved? And he discovered as simple as look unto me, or what we call, you know, by, by grace and true faith, that we are saved. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. And so uh, that's how Spurgeon was safe. Um, I was just browsing through a uh, chick publication. They sent me like a newsletter on the digital copy, and they gave a testimony of the track. Um, somebody gave a track, uh, Holy Joe, all right, or G.I. Joe or something, and to this uh, pilot. And uh, so while waiting for his plane, he uh, read that, and he became a Christian. But what many people didn't realize is that, and that was his personal testimony. He was about to fly that plane and go up and come down to the uh, runway and just kill himself. That was his last flight. And he was about to take his life. 
You know, but somebody just gave him that track, and he found the love of God. He found a purpose of living. And um, so this seed is so independent of this soul well, and the seed is quick and powerful, and the word of God can uh, save soul even the, without us. And lastly, we're going to look at the soil. Let's go back to Matthew 13 and verse 3 to verse 9. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse 3 to verse 9, <laughs> I'll read from verse 4. And when he, had, when he sowed, uh, some seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls came in and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, and because there had no deepness of earth, when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they uh, withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up, and choked them, and others fell into good ground, and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who had ears to hear, let him hear. Some seed that fell on stony ground. And we know when the seed fell on the stony ground, it's almost a goner. Okay, the birds will come and pick it up. Um, now, I've got to say this carefully. Some people will not be safe. Not because God didn't want to save them. Because they never want to be safe. You know, some people, no matter what you say, how you explain, what proof you show about creation, evolution, and things like that, they will never believe. You know, but my prayer is that none of us here will be one of this. It will be a sad thing, you know. And um, some say it will fall on stony ground. It's not because God doesn't want to save them. They don't want to be saved because they enjoy the pleasures of this world. And then we find that some will fell by uh, the uh, shallow ground, where there's not much earth. Uh, they will be very enthusiastic for a while. They had only an opinion, but not a conviction. And we find that eventually they will go away. Some will fall on the, um, the thorny ground. Um, could have been a fruitful life, you know, but uh, they are so caught up with the things of the world that they become unfruitful. Uh, so winning is the last thing on their mind and they totally become unfruitful. And of course, some will fall on the good ground. This morning, I want to say this, that um, if you do not believe in God, you're living in, the, in an illusion. You say, why? Why, if there is no God, then what are you made up of? Who are you? The only answer you can give, I am my brain. Because, you know, my reality is the emergent property of my brain. And what is your brain made up of? Well, atoms, molecules. So you are just a bunch of uh, deluded, uh, deluded neurons in the head that think that I'm real. <laughs> you realize that? Just a bunch of molecules. And you think you're real, <laughs> you know? If there is no God, it's just only a material world. The world is just molecules in motion. Your brain is just molecules in motion. And you're not really you. Do you realize that? You know? And yet, uh, the Bible tells us we are made in the image of God. And that's why there's a God, uh, there is a, um, there is a emptiness in our heart that only God can feel. And if there is no God, then, you know, we are our brains. But if there is God, then we are not our brains. Uh, we are a living soul. <coughs> well, as I conclude, uh, if this morning we do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to bring up the story of this soul winner trying to talk to a prosecutor. Boy, I mean, uh, one time in my life I met a judge. I was trying to pastor, he's a Christian. I was trying to pastor him, he was trying to judge me, all right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this guy met a prosecutor and trying to share the gospel. So he told the prosecutor this. He said, uh, you will punish uh, anyone that, that broke the law, right? He said, yeah. 
Say, have you ever broken the laws of the country? You say, yes, just that wasn't caught. <laughs> you know, and when you punish somebody, uh, what will happen? While you sentence him, he goes to jail or he pays a fine. But what if he can't pay a fine? Uh, While well, he goes to prison. But if somebody could pay for him, what happened? Then he's free. You know, and that is the gospel story. We have sinned. We can't pay for our sins. You know, God so loved the world, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die and to pay for our sins. And so um, the uh, amazing thing is that God makes it so simple. <laughs> it's a belief. I'll close with this uh, poem. And it's entitled, My Friend. And uh, it talks about uh, we, I mean, what is really a friend? But uh, I'll just read the poem. It goes something like this. My friend, I stand in judgment now and feel that you are to, bl to be blamed somehow. While on this earth, I walk with you day by day and you never did point the way. You knew the Lord in truth and glory, but never did you tell the story. My knowledge then uh, was very dim. You could have let me save to him. Though we live together here on earth, you never told me of your second birth. And now I stand this day condemned because you failed to mention him. You taught me many things that is true. I call you friend and trusted you. But I learn now that it's too late. You could have kept me from this fate. We walk by day and talk by night, and yet you show me not the line. You let me live, love, and die, all the while you knew I'll never live on high. Yes, I call you friend in life and trusted you in joy and strife. Yet in coming to this end, I see you weren't really my friend. And that is to say we have friends that we talk and we laugh with them, but we never point them the way to Jesus Christ. And we let them die and go to hell. And uh, we are not really their friends. And so... Uh, let us truly be like the sower. And if we are the sower, the Lord Jesus Christ will say to us, Behold, the sower. We are a wonder to behold if we are truly a sower in the pastor, please.